And I was so ready to defend it as well. I was like, why is everyone so fussy? But that part was really just so... Persuasion 2022, the problematic ancestor in a long line of film adaptations of Jane Austen's Persuasion, a book that was published in 1817. I think we can all agree that a lot has changed since that book was published. So how should an adaptation in modern times look, sound, feel? A lot of people feel that it shouldn't feel anything like this. <laughs> Thanks, I hate it. This is not what we wanted. That is what I'm hearing from the articles. And oh, there are articles. Now for my sins, I love a good smug think piece, I do, and I also really love the novel Persuasion. I'll be honest, unlike other Jane Austen books, I've never really found an adaptation of Persuasion that I felt particularly drawn to, so my hopes were high and I refused for them to be slashed by the bad reviews I was seeing before I saw it myself. I really went in thinking, I'm gonna defend this movie, whatever it's like, like my firstborn f***ing micro pig, I don't care. <laughs> so you could say I was a little subjective, going in and coming out, I had a lot of mixed feelings. We're gonna unpack them here. Were the critics right or were they wrong? Who am I to say? But I'm gonna say it anyway. And I've broken up my thoughts into four categories. Casting, script, visuals, and sentiment. Hopefully from those four factors, you'll be able to decide whether this is a film for you, whether you have loved Persuasion since its actual publication, or it feels like, or if you don't really give a shit about Jane Austen and you just want a good feel good film. Casting. Now, I've got a tiny little, tiny little, tiny little wishbone, tiny little baby toe, little finger bone to pick with the criticisms of casting Dakota Johnson in this role. Now, some of them span around the idea that Anne Elliot, our main character, is uh, shy. Now, I don't find any textual evidence for that in the book. I've read it several times and I actually reread the first third of this book before seeing the movie and marked out all the times when Anne Elliot's character is actually described. I'm not gonna read out every single example because this isn't a university lecture, but <laughs> suffice to say, I don't really think that's true. And, and I have never have I ever. <laughs> I swear, thought that was true. Obviously people are free to interpret her that way, but honestly I see very little evidence for it in the text. Is she sidelined? Yes. Is she ignored? Totally. But she's present from the first few pages, voicing her opinions, pushing the narrative on, being quite a stickler for her opinions and things that she thinks should happen to the family. And I'm sure that anyone who actually has a similar personality to Anne Elliot will agree that there is a difference between being sidelined and being quiet. So I don't think that complaint for casting Dakota Johnson in this role is completely valid. However, I do understand this idea that she may have played it a little bit too modern. I get that. She slouches a lot. She has very modern mannerisms. She doesn't take on the kind of physicality of somebody who lived during that time. Although, have any of us actually met anyone from that time? Are there any Time Lords here? I don't think. What I do like about Dakota Johnson and what I think works is that she is a character that always, you always look at her and you feel like there's more going on behind the eyes. You feel like she has a secret. She is, she looks like she has an incredibly rich internal world. Um, unlike a lot of the other castings, to be honest, of Anne Elliot characters in the past. So in that way, I really liked her casting. I thought she did it very well. I thought there could be some more specific directions around making it still feel a little bit period. As we'll discuss in the rest of the video, that wasn't probably probably the focus of the director's heart for any of this film. So that's kind of understandable. It's not what I would have done, but that doesn't make it bad. Loads of the supporting characters I was really impressed with. Anne's younger sister was a perfectly believable caricature, which is what she's written as. So I thought she was really good. The dad was really good. Loads of the other supporting characters were great. I didn't feel like there was much chemistry between her and Captain Wentworth, which was a shame, but I don't, I think he was a bit of a wet blanket in this. He was a, a little bit of a soggy tea towel, to be honest. So I wasn't impressed with the male casting, but what can you do? Scraps from the table. Generally, when it comes to Jane Austen adaptations, I don't think this was a badly cast film. <laughs> the script. Now, this is where uh, my faith in my uh, strong conviction to defend the film started to really crack. 
<laughs> Obviously, there are lots of like critiques of it. Like they use stuff like Captain Wentworth giving her loads of sheet music and her calling it a playlist, calling him her ex, phrases like he's a 10, all crept into the script and like, very intentionally. It wasn't like they did it clumsily. They obviously meant to do it. Whether it was a good choice or not is up for debate, but it wasn't, it was, it was pointed. It was, it was there. It was a strong, clear decision. <laughs> they chose to have no authorial voice. It was told from Anne's perspective, direct to camera, almost like she was writing a diary, which I think is a shame because honestly, the funniest thing about Jane Austen novels is the narration. And in loads of other adaptations like the uh, 1997 Emma, they actually chose to have a voiceover and it's really fucking funny. Um, so I think that's a shame. But again, in the vein of Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, and my mad fat diary and stuff like it's it's not unheard of and it is i think it's a good narrative device so it's fine that they switched it it's a shame because the source material is so good but i wasn't mad about that aspect i also like i think that the fourth wall breakage which is a very contentious thing in the reviews uh yes okay it's kind of annoying it is overdone but calling it just a flea bag rip off is completely like exhausting and very lazy obviously journalists are doing it because of seo flea bag performs incredibly well in Google searches so why wouldn't you combine that with a new film to get more hits on your article it's fine but breaking the fourth wall really is that a flea bag th is that a flea bag thing <laughs> or have you just never watched any film or been to the theater before or however flea bag character does appear in this film and I would argue as my boyfriend Craig pointed out to me Captain Wentworth kind of looks like that guy that she meets on the bus no. So I think there were a lot of feelings there and obviously there was probably a board meeting where they were like, oh yeah, we'll accept your fourth wall breakage because that worked well with Fleabag. So I think it was probably a justification for the funding rather than actually probably supposed to be copying Fleabag. Honestly, my problem with the script is that lots of the modern interventions just weren't that funny. The only time that I thought that it was funny was when they were applying modern day like self-care. I just need to like look inside myself. My therapist and things are blah, blah, blah. Like applying that to Anne's younger sister because it was very accurate and very apt. And, and I thought that part was quite funny, but generally the modern slang kind of approach was just unsuccessful because it wasn't that funny. If they'd gone further with it, it would have been really funny. If they'd gone a little bit more subtle with it, it would have been a bit funnier. There was loads of moments where I just felt like they didn't really trust the audience to understand something. So instead of, I don't know, they wouldn't have had to like directly quote Jane Austen. They could have just said something like, I must ardently admit that your company is so pleasing to me that I must impose my presence on you tomorrow for another hit. But instead they just say, I like you. I want you in my life which is just, we would have got the first one, why? Um, abbreviating thank you to thanks, again, has no narrative purpose. Why, 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 why? Instead of a more flowery sentence complimenting the gardens, he literally just says, these gardens are so beautiful. Uh, 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 uh. But my biggest bugbear with the script was I think changing something quite vital about the whole point of Jane Austen's book, like the, the literal whole point, the literal whole point. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm still recovering. I only saw it yesterday. <laughs> Captain Wentworth, who is a hot naval man and also the subject of her lust, says that she is so intelligent and so amazing that he wishes that they lived in a world where she was an admiral. Now, do I wish that men like that existed in 1817? Totally. Did they exist? Absolutely fucking probably not and definitely not in Captain Wentworth who goes on for paragraphs, paragraphs at the beginning of the book about how he'd never let a woman on one of his ships, how it was inappropriate and how he was fundamentally morally against women being on ships. He is not your soy boy, I'm afraid. And there's a very slap you in the face with a wet fish kind of message at the end. Uh, and I quote, because I wrote it down, this is like, in one of the marriage scenes as we're zooming out, as the emotional music is playing. It's okay to find love on your terms, however unorthodox. Don't let anyone tell you who to love. I can't stress to you how little that is what Jane Austen meant by all of her fucking novels. You'll notice that while the women fall in love, they always marry rich people and they never lower themselves too much below their class status. That is because Jane Austen was a realist. She knew how she maybe wanted the world to be. 
maybe, but she was writing for the world that she was in and the world she was in meant that you couldn't fucking marry somebody if they're really bloody poor. And throughout her authorial voice and all of the stuff that happens to the characters, what she's telling us is that you must be a realist. She's very sympathetic to characters like Charlotte and she makes her heroines the lucky ones, as most of authors have done throughout time. She makes her main characters people who can love their partners with their head and their heart. They're never bad matches on paper as well as romantically. <laughs> so for that reason, I kind of tarred the whole script for me as something that I think was kind of outrageous. And I was so ready to defend it as well. I was like, why is everyone so fussy? But that part was really just so, I don't change the costumes, change the accent, change the script, change the mood. Don't change the whole fucking point of the film. Speaking of that, let's talk about visuals. <music> visuals, this was one of the most beautiful films I've seen in a while. It was so wonderfully shot. It was so cozy and yet artsy and just all the colors were beautiful. There were so many beautiful purples, especially in the dark. There was this shot of them walking up a cliff that was just really stunning. I kept turning to Craig and being like, that's fucking beautiful. Yes, the costumes will probably most rightly be completely roasted by costume expert YouTube and I support them doing that. However, uh, this is my channel. I I have no expertise in period costume. And as a mere punter, as a mere pleb, I watched this film and I thought, yeah, those costumes look quite nice. They look, they look beautiful. I enjoy looking at them. The two points that I did think were a little bit distracting was when she wore a beret. Is this Emily in Persuasion? Paris meets 1800s bath, <laughs> really? <laughs> and also the fact that she was wearing metallic eyeshadow throughout the whole, I kid you not, metallic, it was so metallic. It was so shiny. So those are my only two real complaints about the visuals. In general, I actually thought this visually was beautiful. And as an addendum, I'd say also the music was really nice. And for that reason, I think it's probably gonna turn into a lot of people's comfort film, whatever the critics say, because shockingly in this ball on fire, war ridden, crazy recession filled world, no amount of opinion columns can stop people loving a comfort film. <laughs> And that brings us on to our final segment, sentiment, which is really important. And I think people forget two very crucial things when they're thinking about the sentiment of the people who are making the film. Number one, Jane Austen, dead. So dead, so beyond the grave, six feet under, already eaten by maggots, so gone. She's just gone. And I loved her and I think she's incredible and I'm so glad that she was alive, but she is very dead. And the second thing that I think people forget is that she had a really good sense of humor. She's obviously somebody who could laugh at herself, laugh at others and didn't take life too seriously. So when we go into this almost puritanical aspect of the Jane Austen internet that must preserve her memory and her sentiments at all costs, I think that woman's fucking dead and she probably would find it quite funny. <laughs> Explicitly from the opening title, obviously this film is like based on. This is not claiming to be a direct adaptation of persuasion, nor should it, because then we'd really have to call them liars. However, what they were trying to do was make a really fun film. Did they succeed at that? Kind of not. And that's what I want to talk about when I think about sentiment. Not that they skewed what Jane Austen may or may not have wanted from her film adaptations, even though she hadn't even probably seen a photo camera at that point. I want to speak to the to what end question, which is what I want to ask whenever somebody changes something about something that's very well loved and very well worn is to what end why what was what was the point and a lot of these m moments i think were supposed to make audiences feel more comfortable make them laugh a little bit more make it feel more light-hearted and more well-worn in kind of like bridgerton feels or the emma 2020 adaptation uh, it wanted to make people feel even more welcome than those films however to do that they diluted the script presumably to make it more understandable however we have a lot of cultural evidence that if you give people films like romeo plus juliet by baz Luhrmann or 
or like most of the other Jane Austen adaptations, as long as you give them lots of visual cues and your storytelling is tight, people can understand different periods of speech. It's not that, it's not beyond people to do that. And I think obviously you can make things things simpler. You can untangle certain paragraphs of Jane Austen's writing that are a little bit obscure now, but to change them so much that you have to say that characters can no longer say thank you sir and they have to say thanks feels like you were trying to fix a problem that really wasn't there and that energy could have been better spent on other ways of storytelling and other ways of conveying things i really did like the modernisms of in the same way that in um the emma adaptation we saw the characters naked while they were getting dressed we saw them in more private moments that obviously jane austen wouldn't have been able to show in the books even if she'd wanted to and we saw that as well with dakota johnson like swigging from a bottle of wine i don't doubt that women did that <laughs> in the 1817s. If there's one thing I know that women have always probably been doing is trying to get access to alcohol to deal with men. <laughs> Perhaps there is a problem to be solved because despite all the amazing adaptations of Jane Austen that have come before, and oh, there have been many, lots of people still don't feel like Jane Austen is for them. Loads of people hate Jane Austen, haven't really heard of Jane Austen. When you get out of your bubble, you realise that actually Jane Austen is quite inconsequential to a large amount of the population uh, in your country slash in the world. And maybe she, should, maybe she doesn't have relevance across the world or to some people and that's totally fine but because I think it's so fun and because I think it's so funny I would love more people to read and watch Jane Austen stories and yes as some people have said is Jane Austen just lots of rich people going to each other's houses um, yeah that's that's pretty much it but when we see the success of Love Island we know that that's just one fucking house that's just people staying in one house and talking about small domestic relationship issues so if people love love island i think they have the capacity to love jane austen and maybe we haven't made enough films and made people feel enough welcome in those realms to bring more people in to her fucking hilarious genius because i would call that missing out but maybe i'm biased in summary persuasion 2022 isn't going to do any more damage to the original text or the or all the other adaptations that have come after it in the same way that Oliver and Company didn't do any damage really to Charles Dickens' great novel Oliver or Clueless hasn't done any real damage to the original text of Emma. These things are inherently, I think, a little bit harmless and we don't need to worry about them so much. So it's not worrying, it's going to be okay. Nobody has stopped reading Taming of the Shrew because 10 Things I Hate About You came out. In fact, I was one of the teenagers who loved 10 Things I Hate About You and read Taming of the Shrew as a result of that. So anything that draws people into the original text, I think is fine by me. Just like things like Bridgerton or Lex Crouch's brilliant novels set in Regency times where people get drunk and there's loads of debauchery and casual modern language or like Taylor Swift songs playing in violins while people waltz. Like anything that brings us closer the, to the humanity of these characters that can feel incredibly alien because of their dress and their way of holding themselves and the language that they use is a net positive. The only thing that I think is kind of unforgivable is the insertion of a feminist perspective from Captain Wentworth and this this really net knock on the head sentiment at the end that what Jane Austen was saying was, fuck it, love whoever you like, go on a love cruise. Like apparently Anne Elliot's mentor has been doing all this time sure i think adaptations like this can make the past more human but they shouldn't make try and make the past kinder because it wasn't for women this is a, this is a very unkind kind time to be many kinds of people including a woman so for that i'm a bit like did you need did you did you need to? But I'm not counting myself out of the number of people who will probably use this as a lovely, fuzzy comfort film to watch when they're ill. As the new COVID numbers rise, we're gonna need more of those sofa films again, I think. And also, it already exists, let us watch it. We're all gonna die, we might as well enjoy a good period rom-com before we do, and hopefully we don't die before our 41st birthday like Jane Austen herself. RIP, thanks for the music love you jane <laughs> thank you so much for watching this video my name is lena norms if you haven't been here before and you'd like to be here again there is a subscribe button down there my book bargain bin rom-com 
segue um, has just come out and it's a fun poetry collection so just like if you never felt invited to Jane Austen but you might like an adaptation like Persuasion if you haven't really felt invited to poetry this is fun accessible poetry a good place for you to start this video has been made possible by the gumption club who tip me per video to make sure these videos keep happening and if you like this video you might like any of these videos floating around my head right now frog snog out